Welcome, Eagles, to another episode of Trad Cat Night Radio. I'm Eric Ajewski, founder and owner of Trad Cat Night, the most viewed and followed traditional Catholic website worldwide, ranked number one in the world by Alexa as it relates to traditional Catholicism, top 20,000 website folks. I want to thank you all for your wonderful prayers and support over the past three years. We just celebrated our three-year anniversary with the close of the calendar year. I want to thank all those alternative news outlets who are picking up not only my articles, but these radio shows, including uh, Veterans Today, a monster website. Surely do appreciate uh, the support in that area. Make sure you subscribe to Tradcat Night right now and click that bell or that notification symbol in order to get these videos straight into your email. I'm finding that uh, there are more and more loopholes <laughs> presenting itself uh, as we move along in this kind of attack against what we are labeled as uh, fake news, alternative media. So please make sure you do that. I also want to remind everyone that these full-length radio shows come to you free of charge, but we go and grow. We maintain this website through your charity, so please click that PayPal button. Get behind Trad Cat Night for cash, check, or money order contributions. Uh, please send me an email to apostleofmary at hotmail.com. And lastly, folks, uh, for those who seem to find it a little bit difficult in hearing some of these radio shows, I remind everyone that uh, sometimes the audio is based upon Skype. Uh, connectivity so if it's sometimes heard as being shoddy if you will or distant uh, please turn up your volume both on your YouTube video and also just your computer itself without further ado I'm going to bring on today's special guest get ready for this one folks uh, we're going to be talking with Mr. Jay Dyer now he runs the website jaysanalysis.com and Jay's analysis has grown to become one of the premier film and philosophy sites on the internet showcasing the talents of Jay Dyer, whose graduate work focused on the interplay of film, geopolitics, espionage, and psychological warfare. Jay is a public speaker, lecturer, comedian, author of the popular title, Esoteric Hollywood Sex Cults and Symbols in Film, as well as the host of the Jay Analysis podcast. Uh, Jay is also a regular contributor to 21st Century Wire, Soul of the East, Espionage History Archive, uh, broaching subjects as wide as satire, metaphysics, film analysis, theology, geopolitics, literature, and history, as well as interviewing numerous prominent figures. So he has his own uh, radio show podcast, too. You can get to his uh, YouTube channel. I'll put it in the description box for you, Jay Dyer, so you can't possibly miss it, so you can subscribe to his channel. Jay has authored hundreds of articles already, read by millions in just the past few years, and again, he's been seen another prominent alternative uh, media outlets, if you will, Leak Project being one of them. I have an interview with Rex coming up here in a little bit today. Uh, so, Jay, where where do we get going with this? I mean, you're kind of talking off air very briefly, and I just mentioned to you how we're kind of moving from a Catholic-slash-Christian culture into this New Age culture. Esotericism uh, <laughs> plays a, you know, a big deal in this, and obviously your book has really hit home. And I tell everyone, listen – I go to the movies, but I don't go to watch it for entertainment value. I actually go to see if there's predictive programming in it. You know, what's the mm -hmm. next, you know, New World Order agenda, all the hand signs. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. so wild. And so maybe we can start uh, with how you began to be involved with unmasking all this. You know, a little bit more about your background mm -hmm. maybe first. Well, I, I grew up loving arts, so I was always interested in doing things like acting or, or comedy or satire. And when I was 18, I did, I did stand up for a little while, just kind of doing amateur nights. And it was a lot of fun. It was a blast. But I started realizing that, that uh, the whole field of entertainment is not what we generally think of it as, you know, just harmless fun or whatever. It's also very much a part of the state apparatus. It's sort of a an arm of the, the, the of the octopus, a leg of the octopus that is uh, very crucial for forming our worldviews and our opinions. And so I started realizing the movies had a lot of messages in them. And then when I went to college and did grad work, uh, I took film classes. I was still interested in film. And uh, I took a lot of lit classes and history classes and philosophy and so forth. And it all kind of coalesced into me just kind of thinking, why not write film reviews, maybe the way that uh, somebody like Roger Ebert does, but a little more philosophical, maybe a little more theological bent, and, and criticize what's in a lot of these films. And I mean, it's not all criticism. I mean, sometimes there's good films. I you know, Obviously, not every film is bad, but I, I started realizing that 
we really needed a, a there's a place for film criticism that integrates all of these different aspects uh, of what I would consider a, a more proper theological worldview or, or foundation uh, so that we aren't beguiled and, and bedeviled and spooked by this culture. And that's really what I think Hollywood does is it, I liken it to the Wizard of Oz, you know, the man behind the curtain, or I liken it to, um, you know, Plato's cave. <clears throat> and that's a, a decent section of my book is, is talking about Platonism and Plato's cave and how even Plato back in the ancient, you know, Greek era noticed that, Everybody was entranced by the phantasms and things that don't matter, that, that are temporal, that pass away, and they, they much to the neglect of things that are eternal. And so Plato, uh, with that allegory of the cave, was trying to tell us that you know, we, we need to exit the cave and look for capital T truth yeah. and not fall for these, these. And that's really what Hollywood does, what mass media does. And, and when I say Hollywood, you can include the news <laughs> because... Oh, yeah. The news that calls us fake news are actually just an extension of Hollywood, in my view. So, and they use all the same t uh, you know, tricks, tactics, fake fakery, stagecraft, uh, CGI. You know, they're, they're constantly caught doing this stuff. So that's why I started doing what I what I what I'm doing. I, I had a passion for what's true, uh, seeking the truth, and I wanted to hopefully influence things for the better. Try to try to do something good, uh, and. You know, I started writing film reviews, and I was also writing other articles too, theology, philosophy, and stuff like that. But as you could probably imagine, what gets the most traffic is a movie review. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, that's probably that's probably eighty percent of my traffic, and then all these other theological, geopolitical stuff. It's like uh, nobody's nobody's going to read that. <laughs> there you go. Well, yeah, you have got a latest piece here. It looks like it came out just a few days ago. Paparazzi and propaganda. Why don't you give us a synopsis and breakdown of that? Uh, piece right there again you already mentioned mainstream media it seems like it's kind of a last ditch effort to kind of rub us out i don't yeah. know how you have been censored uh jay but i've been telling people now for a while i've been uh booted off of facebook uh, uh twitter half a dozen times i can't even post my own blog straight from my website now on twitter i'm labeled a malicious site uh you know are we entering into a world where I mean, they simply don't want Christianity around. They don't want conservatism around, and just all they want is liberal Looney Tune uh, websites on the web. I mean, is that day coming? Well, yeah, so the, what this article or what this uh, interview was, was there's a guy from the U.K. who's kind of a legendary uh, paparazzo, and I noticed that in, in the independent media, you don't have anybody really talking about that angle, but who would be better to deconstruct the – glitz and the glam and the smoke and mirrors than somebody who was a paparazzo for 10 years. Yeah. And so he was actually involved in some pretty big uh, PR things and some, some scandalous sort of stage publicity stunt satire stuff. And so we, we did a about an hour interview with uh, him and his buddy talking about uh, some of the great stories that he has and, and his, he's over in London. So that his view of the UK is, it's not exactly the same as the U.S., but, it, yeah, cel celebrity culture kind of works the same way, obviously. So we really just deconstructed that as a, as a big a big sham and talked about how it also ties into the way that mass media works, right? Because, I mean, I, I just thought he would have a really interesting insight that most people wouldn't, right? I mean, if you sure. interview some boring news anchor, right? But, uh, yeah, he has some great stories about staging uh, uh, this guy that ran in. He's called the Comedy Terrorist, and he, he ran in and kissed, I think, Prince William in the midst of a uh, birthday party uh, and ran past security. <laughs> so he, he was dressed as bin Laden oh, in drag, so it was like this weird sort of satirization of this phony war on terror. Yeah. So anyway, that, that's what that was about. But uh, absolutely, if you talk about... The removal of anything traditional, I, I would consider myself uh, pretty roughly a traditionalist, and um, I tend to I, I tend to Orthodox church. So, okay, uh, I think that anything that is deemed traditional, yeah, like you said, is slated to be uh, slated for the guillotine. And yeah, well, that's just, because they can't have anything like that uh, going into where they want to go in terms of the brave world, in terms of the you know, the Fabian socialist uh, model, uh, sort of a corporate uh, global government. Uh, that is the state of plan. That is uh, absolutely where they're going. In fact, I did a, a, 
an eight-part lecture series on the totality of uh, Carol Quigley's Tragedy and Hope, which is this giant 1,300-page book. Yeah. Written from the perspective of the CFR, if you're not familiar with it. So I, I go through the, in the entirety of the book, and he lays it all out. And of course, he was an apologist for the system. He wasn't uh, a critic of it. And he just lays it out and says, yeah, this is where we're going. This is what's best for man. And it's the, it's the quote, hope, right, in, 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 in response to the tragedy of the, the two world wars of the 20th century. So uh, it's, it's a global corporate government with uh, socialism for the masses uh, and um, sort of a and a uh, freedom of uh, total control for the oligarchs above the above the masses who are in this sort of fascist corporate uh, scheme of things. Uh, and then you've got, I do believe you do, you have these sort of really powerful families like the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers who are kind of at the top of that pyramid. So that's where they want to go. And you can't, in order to get to that end goal, you can't have anything that operates as a firewall. And that could be things like the family. That could be things like, Tradition that can be things like heritage that could be things like uh, nation states, right? And I'm not saying that all nation states are therefore good But I'm just saying that from their perspective anything that could be a hedge a stumbling block right to Total homogenization and globalization has to be done away with Yeah, they want a total potluck of the nations if you will this one world socialist republic that the pre-vatican two popes talked about You know, I'm yep. very candid when I come out and I say I have no doubt that Francis you know, I don't know if you know this, Jay, but there's many of us who actually don't even hold him as the true pope. We would say he's a, a true anti-pope, an imposter pope. Uh, but we actually, I, I, I do know about Sedevacantism. I was uh, involved with some Sedevacantists for a while, so uh, yeah, I, I, and I understand that position. I also understand the resist and uh, recognize resist position and all that too. And I've done a lot of talks about the Vatican as well, so so I, I understand where you're coming from. All right, good deal. Yeah, I mean, that's what the Vatican is trying to uh, label us as. You know, fundamentalists, we're Pharisees, we're too rigid. They want to push us over uh, the edge of the cliff here, folks. And again, I, I can't harp on this enough. Uh, what's coming from uh, Vatican II, the social justice program, is exactly mm -hmm. the same as the New Age Antichrist coming, Maitreya. It's this le legitimate redistribution of wealth. It's, you know, everyone get together and share and come together in John Lennon fashion. And that's why you're seeing the breakdown of borders. Uh, you know, it, it's coming, folks. I mean, whether you like it or not. My next question for you is, uh, you know, getting back to just kind of the, the celebrity aspect of it, if you will, uh, the entertainment industry, you know, this dark side, if you will, will of the occult and o overall Luciferianism. Uh, is the trend that more and more celebrities are coming out and trying to expose it? I don't want to get too conspiratorial or some, you know, Michael Jackson came out and was making implications you know, of the hand behind the scene, and maybe he got knocked off. And then we've had, I think, Corey Feldman, or one of the Corys coming out pretty recently, talking about the satanic pedophilia network. And I saw this other video, the bassist player of the Scorpion, saying there's a, a very elaborate elitist snuff film club, if you will. you got to pay like 100 k to get in. You actually watch people die. And I, I honestly, I, I believe these people, Jay. I, mean, I don't know about you. Feel free to disagree. I mean, I don't think these people uh, are making this stuff up. I mean, are we finding more people becoming brave? And trying to come out and expose this this type of uh, nonsense behind the scenes. Uh, I would think you. I, th I think you probably have a combination of all the above. I think some people, you know, really did experience bad things, and they're they're legitimately exposing uh, or attempting to expose trauma that they experienced and networks that they've experienced. You've had documentaries like An Open Secret uh, that talk about pedophilia in Hollywood that was heavily suppressed. Interestingly, uh, well, you can find it on YouTube, but uh, I think it ties into what we see in the Vatican. I don't think there's a there's there's a definite connect there. If you look at the Franklin cover up, you see sure. Boys Town. Boys Town is at work there. Uh, we look at the UK with Savile. Savile was uh, good buddies with uh, well, not just John Paul II, but also I think the one of the pederast uh, cardinals. I think from Scotland. I, I, his name escapes me off the top of my head, but but they're all tied into the same networks, and so it is a kind of a global network, and that's because the globalists uh, are involved in black markets globally. <laughs> so, you know, if you're, if you're going to control the globe, you're not just interested in running legitimate markets. You also got to run the drugs and the human trafficking and all that. So it's all part of it, and uh, a lot of what goes on with the, the sexual stuff is, uh, in my view, blackmail. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of good exposés that have talked about this. And so once you've got somebody, you know, who's, if they've had their, their gay tryst or their 
underage tryst, then you, you've got them, right? And so the establishment uses that as a means to coerce people. And that's, that's why you don't see people very often, you know, say in, in go government or politics, uh, uh, going awry. <laughs> they, oh, why do they toe the party line? Well, on the one hand, they toe the party line because you're, they're getting paid to. I mean, that's an easy way to, to make sure people toe the line. But if that doesn't work, you can pull out the you know, big guns and pull out a photo of them with, you know, something, a, a goat at a ceremony or something, who knows, right? Yeah. I mean, it just depends. But so, yeah, I would say that you do have uh, people speaking out, but mainly because to a degree. Uh, but also sometimes that can be PR. People can stage these things and make these things up because they um, they need publicity or they want they want sympathy. I'm not saying that that always happens. I'm just saying sure. it's just a, you know case by case basis. But but yeah, it's all very real. Um, and there are these dark forces. And I, I'm not a, personally a fan of Malachi Martin. I kind of think he was a, a bad guy. But it is interesting to get his perspective as a sort of insider. Uh, even if he can't be believed in everything, he seems to have been uh, telling the truth when he talked about the satanic cabal in the Vatican and when he talked about the Jesuits being uh, in certain capacities Luciferian at certain levels. Uh, and so I think that if there's enough, definitely enough evidence out there, you know, William Kennedy's book, Lucifer's Lodge, talks about a lot of the same stuff. Uh, he's, he wrote that from a traditional Catholic perspective. Um, so all this stuff is out there, and I think it is very real, um, and you, you have all the above. Now, what's your take? We're going to jump around here a little bit, keep our listeners on their toes. What, what do you make of what's going on here in the United States, the elections? Uh, you know, with our following, uh, I would say it's about 50-50 split. There's some who believe that, you know, he's just another uh, Jew Masonic puppet Trump. There's other who, who really take what they see, not only from the mainstream media, but other alternative news outlets and say, OK, you know, this guy's the real deal. I'm actually going to have on a guest who's got he's writing a book currently linking him to Scottish Freemasonry and uh, Jewish mafia and things along that line. I, I mean, were these elections rigged? Uh, and again, feel feel free to agree, disagree with that. But, you know, we're, what's the direction that this country is heading in? I mean, we are we headed for worldwide revolution here i mean not only here in the united states uh with the potentiality of an economic class which i think many of us are expecting uh and i just kind of wanted to get you know your breakdown on that because i know you you covered to some degree this, this mm -hmm. type of information yeah i, I do a lot of geopolitics and, and some politics uh i think it's a little more complicated with the trump situation because uh he does represent a, a faction of the of the elite and i don't think that the Elite are necessarily always 100% lock and step together. Uh, I think there are disagreements. You can see elements of this in, if you look at the mafia model, the mob model, sometimes there are legitimate agreements between one mob and another mob. And uh, that's kind of how I see entities like the CIA or, or whatever. I just see them as kind of versions of, of the mob and uh, bigger mobs, maybe. Um, and so the, the, the chief mob would, of course, be like the CFR and, and, and the families that run that entity. That's kind of the big mafia. Uh, and I don't think that everything was staged when it came to uh, the CFR did not like Trump. None of them liked Trump. None of them wanted him in that role. All of their media outlets were 100 percent against him. Uh, so it's possible that there was, I think, at a higher level, some level of, of disagreement over who would take that role. Now, of course, the presidents aren't ultimately that powerful. I mean, they, they have a visual, perceptive, symbolic role of power, which is, in a sense, powerful because they can't influence a lot of people. And certainly Trump made it more normative to not be PC. He kind of opened the floodgates for not having to be so politically correct. Uh, so I see Trump kind of like Brexit in that he represents, uh, on the part of people's perception, a rejection of the status quo and the establishment. Um, whether that means that he is 100% uh, legitimately behind his rhetoric, I, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but I, just, I, just think, I don't think it's easy. It's, life is as simple as just boxing everything into, oh, it's just a, another part of the conspiracy, another part of the conspiracy. Oh, he's controlled, he's controlled, he's controlled. I mean, not everybody is controlled. So um, there's also, uh, 
other indicators like he kind of represents the mob faction of the elite. Uh, I, I, people have argued this, which I think is sensible. Okay. Uh, and is in, in that he made his wealth uh, partly from casinos. And due to the wranglings of the financial elite, the casino industry did not do well, <laughs> especially after 2008, because the middle class didn't have the money to spend. So that probably hurt Trump quite a bit. Uh, and his also other connected mob interests, I'm guessing. I don't know if this is true, but I'm guessing. And I've also heard some interesting stories about how when Trump took on the real estate market in New York, he was actually taking on quite a few Jewish interests. Uh, now, they would not have appreciated that with this, uh, you know, Scottish guy coming coming in and trying to make a big name there. And that's why you'll actually see a lot of films like Gremlins 2 are literally parodying Trump uh, with uh, Clump or Clamp Industries uh, in, in, as the character or Spielberg's uh, fifth character in uh, uh, Back to the Future 2 is, is a kind of a parody of Trump. So I don't think it's just as simple as black and white. Everybody's all controlled or he's 100% a good guy. Uh, there's probably a lot of gray area there, but ultimately the president's not that big of a role. But what we're going to see pretty quick when he, you know, if he if he goes back and all this stuff he was saying he was going to do. Yeah, I mean, that's just it. It seems so far some are scratching their heads because a lot of neocon people being yeah. uh, put under Trump. You know, a lot of people connected to Goldman Sachs and people are scratching their heads. He seems to be pretty much for the police state. As far as what I can see, and, and mm -hmm. I know yeah. we kind of talked about that a little bit, the whole war on terror sham is just uh, solidifying uh, the global police state. And so I think we're going to see um, mm -hmm. a, a more major event. And I've had on F. William Engdahl, Wayne Madsen, both credible. And, they, you know, again, they went into kind of his Jewish mafia connections and, and some of the money that he uh, got to get rolling in the yeah, real estate industry. I, I, that's a good point. I, I talked to Ingdahl about that as well. I, I just can't, some of the moves, I can't figure out why why he would do it if he's totally controlled. I, I, just, I, I mean, I think he probably, he's a deal maker, so he's probably made a lot of deals. Uh, and I would assume he's also pissed a lot of people off. So. <laughs> That's the same. Now, but, but, you're, but you're right, though. The, the neocons obviously made me leery, and I, I don't really have much expectation for a president to do anything anyway. Right, so. exactly. Yeah, I agree with you. They're just puppets. Uh, but, yeah, he, he was the lesser of two evils. I know many Catholics went out there and just people in general general voted for the lesser of two evils. Uh, so at least we could say, he, he, you know, maybe on the surface level he's trying to pretend to be good so I could see why people would vote for him. Uh, but now talk about predictive programming here. Have you seen the, the Simpson episode? I guess it was like 10 years ago that I actually predicted, you know, Trump was going to be in office. Then we got this Illuminati card game. That's uh, quite clear. It, it, it's showing and demonstrating Trump and these potential assassination attempts on him. It's, it's just, I, I don't well, know what to make of it. You know what I mean? What do you, what do you think about when you, when you see stuff like that? I mean, well, I, I, I deal with predictive programming in, in my book, Esoteric Hollywood, quite a bit. So there's quite a few examples that I talk about, and uh, I've, I've given lectures and talks publicly on that subject, too, where I go into a lot of those. And the, uh, the Simpsons one from, I think, 2000, where Lisa becomes president, or, yeah, L Lisa becomes president in the future, and then she's, it's mentioned in the script that she's inherited an economic disaster from President Trump. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's, I, now, now, on the one hand, you, you could say, well, in that case, it, it, Trump did say a long time ago, you know, I think I'm going to run for president. I think I'd be good at the job. Okay, I think I'm going to run for president. So he's been saying that for a long time. Like back back in the 80s, you can oh, find yeah. clips of him saying that. He would take out ads, you know, in the New York Times or whatever. But um, so it could just be that that if you took that instance alone, it could, you could explain it away and say, well, people have known that Trump wanted to run for president for a long time. But there's so many examples of this that I don't think you can chalk all of this up to to coincidence because. Uh, I mean, you've got Neo's passport in the Matrix is explicitly, or excuse me, no, it's his passport. He explicitly lists his birth date, and of course, that's a future dystopia. The movie came out in 1999, and it lists his birth date as, as, as September 11, 2001. Now, there are tons of other examples. Uh, Enemy of the State with uh, Gene Hackman and Will Smith, pre-9-11 movie, uh, full of, li literally has Gene Hackman's birth date as uh, September 1st, uh, 19 or excuse me september 11th that's a new birth it's got somebody's birthday in there maybe it's will smith because that's also in the future i think but 
Uh, th there's not a lot of references in that. I mean, there's so many examples of this, uh, and especially in, in shows like The Simpsons. You're right. But I don't think it can be all chalked up again. And I think they do script these things. Yeah, and I had on uh, a recent guest with us past week, Gavin McInnes. He's been on uh, Fox. I think he's a co-host or something of that Red Eye show. You know, comedian as, as well. Uh, pretty popular yeah, I'm now. Yeah, with Gavin, yeah. Yeah, and so we had him on. We were talking about this, too, a little bit. You know, what's with the leftist kind of infatuation with Russia these days? Talk about PSYOP and talk about uh, just overall brainwash. I mean, is there something I'm missing here? Are they trying to distract us away from some other important news to where it seems like they're blaming Russia on everything, whether it's, you know, hacking into emails, hacking into the, you know, the elections, you know, Russia ate my Cheerios, you know, it just, it's just like, it's getting madness. I, I can't even stand watching mainstream news anymore. What, yeah. what are you to make of this PSYOP? Well, the way to understand this is to understand that the dominant ideology of the Pentagon and of Washington is neoconservatism. And the neoconservatives are all Trotskyites. And that's literally what neocon is. It is the ideology of Trotskyism dressed up in so-called conservatism. And this is, this is what fools so many Christians, Catholics, Orthodox, whatever, evangelical. They, they buy into the bushes and think, oh, they're Christian. No, no, no. They're, they're, they're neocons. Okay. And a neocon is a Trotskyite, even though, even if they don't, they, they, Bush probably didn't even know what Trotskyism is. He's, he's probably not that, that well educated, but I'm saying that if you look at the university of Chicago, where you had all of these Trotskyists moved to right during the cold war period. Uh, and, and it was also the OSS and the CIA that aided the Frankfurt school guys, uh, to leave the, uh, Eastern Bloc countries and bring their Frankfurt School Marxism over to the U.S. And so this is how you got all these professors in the U.S. that were these just insane uh, cultural Marxists that would that would go on to then brainwash generations of youth into what we now see <clears throat> see as the Mongoloid offspring known as the social justice warriors. So what Trotskyism is is this this completely degenerate culture war uh, and totally ruthless pragmatic uh infiltration slash it's and, it, and the reason it's trotskyism is that it's based on fear right so the war on terror when you see all of this ramp all this fear that surrounds the war on terror now you understand that oh that's actually a a, a communist tactic now that sounds counterintuitive what the neocons can't be no no that's why they hate Russia, you see, because the Trotskyites were booted from Russia. I'm not saying Stalin's good, but, but you know, Trotsky had to flee, and uh, Stalin eventually had him killed, right, because they rejected his version of Bolshevism. Right. Uh, so, so Trotskyism blends a lot of things and has this, 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 uh, this penchant for terror, uh, this love for fear, and it believes in a very pragmatic, almost Nietzschean way that you have to you know, constantly just bombard the populace with uh, with fear, and that's how you you know best keep them c controlled, keep them in this sort of catatonic, traumatized state. That's what Len uh, Lenin and Trotsky both talk about that. So in their writings, so that's why the war on terror is such a big deal. It also makes a lot of money. And where did all a lot of these uh, Trotskyite uh, neocons embed themselves? The Rand Corporation. The Rand Corporation is all about mutually assured destruction and fear. And who's the great enemy? Russia. You see, so the whole Cold War was foisted upon everybody by the neocons and the Rand Corporation. And Alex Obeya's book is really good on that, uh, Soldiers of Reason. There's also a great book by Gould and Fitzgerald called uh, Invisible History, uh, the story of Afghanistan, uh, which goes into this neocon background of, of why they had to conquer these various regions. So that is the total 100% explanation for what's going on with Russia and this nonsensical repeat of the cold war right it's like if we it, it, think about movies like red dawn okay these are uh, 80s propaganda films that are supposed to that were at that time supposed to have everybody afraid of a, you know russian invasion which is absolutely impossible like you can't invade the u.s there, there's not going to be an invasion from canada like military experts will talk about that. my dad was in the navy right so he's like there's no way you could invade the u.s i mean it would be it's strategically just a nightmare. So, uh, you know, these movies then, you see something like Red Dawn, are the real way in which the populace is given their perspective of the world, and it's just completely disjointed from reality. Uh, and 
So the hacking situation with Russia is just complete nonsense. It's all made up. I saw on the news today they were saying that the, the imagery that CNN, the, the most notorious liars out there, that the, the CNN was showing is from a video game. They were trying to show everybody how Russia is, quote, hacking the U.S. or whatever. Oh, yeah, Fallout 4, I think, yeah. They're showing images from Fallout 4. So, I mean, <laughs> talk about fake news. So, uh, so yeah, the, they, the neocons love to resurrect these old things. Like, kind of like how they'll roll Bin Laden back out for a long time. Bin Laden disappears for years, and they roll him back out, right? Like on a, yeah. uh, a, a dolly or something. That's, they roll this corpse out. And they do the same thing with the Cold War. Oh, so let's roll this Cold War corpse out and make them all think it's the, uh, that the Russians are doing this. And it's completely ludicrous. Like, there's no... If they were going to hack the elections, I mean, why would they, why would they, um, why, wouldn't they have given Trump the popular vote if they were hacking the, the, the voting machines? That was, the, that was what they were originally saying. Oh, Russians can hack the voting machines. While at the same time, they're saying that if you say that the voting machines can be hacked, it's a, it's a, it's a questioning of our democracy. It ruins our quote democracy. So, I mean, they don't even, they contradict themselves, right? So anyway, I'm, I'm rambling, but you get the point. Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, trust me. Yeah. We've covered this a lot. Yeah. We've been saying here two sides of the same coin, left and right. Um, I want to get more into the, the main crux of things here. I know you're you want to get rolling here with your book. Let's talk a little bit about esoteric Hollywood. I mean, go through this, um, you know, as detailed as you would like, and kind of break this down uh, by chapter. What what are we going to see okay. in this book? You know, uh, what's the basic synopsis of it? You know, I, I want to get specifically into some of your articles here. As a matter of fact, I'd like to reblog one of these uh, articles you've got out from December 19th on the Goonies and the connection with the Illuminati and some Jews and Freemasons. And I'll, I'll get that reblogged back to you so you get traffic. Uh, but I found this this article fascinating. I just read this this morning. I really want you to cover that one as well. But, yeah, break down your, your book. Tell us a little bit more about, you know, what we're seeing from Hollywood. And obviously we, we know – uh, the hand behind the curtain needs to control mainstream media. It needs to control uh, mm -hmm. entertainment. It needs to control the, the, the celebrities, right? I mean, we mm -hmm. see these celebrities brainwashing our kids and even adults. You see all these hand signs and just the sexualization. I mean, it's just madness. Uh, and so let, let's talk a little bit about uh, esoteric Hollywood if we can now. All right. So I guess about seven years ago, I started writing, like I mentioned at the beginning of the interview, uh, film analyses. And this was, this was before Vigil and Citizen was doing film analyses. So... Uh, it was not ripped off of Vigilant Citizen. In fact, probably the other way around. Uh, that's a different story. But So I, I wrote analyses of some weird 80s movies just kind of for fun. And I thought, well, it would be fun to just kind of play around with this idea. And then it started getting traction. I thought, why don't I just write more of these film reviews and tie in more of the conspiracy elements? Because I started noticing that actually there's a lot of conspiracy in film, right? There's a lot of uh, statecraft, there's a lot of espionage, there's a lot of, uh, you know, all this stuff. And I, at the, around the same time, I started studying uh, Ian Fleming's works, the Bond stories, and so forth. And if you look into Ian Fleming's actual life, you know, he was a high-level naval psyops guy, and he helped actually start the OSS with Bill Donovan, which would become the CIA. So uh, Ian Fleming actually played some pretty profound roles in terms of uh, international spycraft. Uh, and I thought, well, actually, if you watch these movies, you, you're the, the old ones at least, right, based on Fleming with Connery and so forth, you're actually seeing quite a bit of uh, a real, real world black ops. So it's a window into understanding things. So that's kind of what started the idea for a book. I thought, well, maybe one day I can have enough of these, you know, kind of collect them into a book. And then uh, after I'd done about 100 or 110 reviews or analyses, uh, I finally got approached by a publisher, and uh, it was uh, Trying Day, which does a lot of conspiracy-related books. And so it took about two years to put it all together, and I, I, I kind of had to just pick them out as, as I thought would be most relevant and interesting. So, that, so the choice for the inclusion uh, was based on uh, relevance in terms of like the first 80 or so pages is Kubrick movies, so I do... Uh, Eyes Wide Shut, I do The Shining, and I do 2001, uh, so that takes up about 80 pages, um, and I begin the book talking about film as ritual, uh, and, and I don't think most people conceive of it that way, but I think that a lot of Hollywood conceives of it that way, and if you understand Kabbalism and different ideas, uh, or even paganism or things like this that have been prominent in Hollywood uh, or are popular uh, in different 
trends and so forth, right? Like a lot of this uh, masonry and so forth that we see that is actually popular in Hollywood and the music industry and so forth. Right. You can understand how they would view film as ritual. Uh, and so I start with that thesis and then I attempt to sort of prove that thesis in the book. And I think the first <laughs> example I give Eyes Wide Shut is one of the best proofs of that. Um, and then I go on in the next 80 or 90 pages to do Spielberg films. Uh, and I chose Kubrick and Spielberg and Hitchcock because they, they're seminal directors. You know, their films are some of the most, obviously, the most well-known, most grossing films of all time. Uh, but what I talk about, I talk about science fiction and how science fiction is a lot of propaganda and, and brainwashing. And that what, a lot of times what we think of as popular science is actually science fiction. Uh, I, view Darwin, I view Darwinism as science fiction. And if you look at the origins of where it comes from, if you look at the prominence of, of Masonic characters like H.G. Wells, then you realize that, oh, actually, H.G. Wells was writing propaganda. He, he, he wasn't, I mean, he was like the Neil deGrasse Tyson of his day, right? Uh, and, and I view Neil deGrasse Tyson as a propaganda fiction figure. I mean, they're, they're, they're playing these roles, and I believe they're probably actually Pentagon weaponized figures to spread the idea and give people the the semblance of wisdom and knowledge, right? Like, the, oh, I, I don't know about science. I follow that Neil deGrasse Tyson guy. But actually what he's teaching is a, an absurd form of scientism, which goes back to Enlightenment figures like David Hume. Uh, and it's very easily easy to deconstruct if you have kind of a basic philosophical knowledge. And that's what I try to do in the book is also what I try to do on my website is give people basic philosophy knowledge too. So there's I do a lot of lectures on Plato and logic and so forth. And and so when I go through the Spielberg movies, I look at E.T., I look at Close Encounters, I look at AI, I look at Metal Report, I talk about transhumanism, I talk about aliens, and I talk about how I believe that the alien mythos is largely manufactured to kind of replace biblical theology and tradition in the West and to give us a new, to give us a new gospel, a new mythos that actually blends well with Darwinism and uh, the, yeah. whole, the whole alien mythos blends well with Darwinism. It also blends well with the New Age, which you, you talk about quite a bit, and I do talk about that too in my book. Uh, and then the, in the third section, it's a little more lighthearted, sort of a, <clears throat> some satire, some fantasy. I, I try to be funny in my, my analyses too, so I talk about uh, some 80s movies, and I talk about Blade Runner and Never Any Story, Labyrinth. Um, I also do some of those weird 70s dystopias like Logan's Run and Zardoz with Sean Connery, which are actually Masonic movies uh, if, you, if you watch them closely. Uh, and then in the last section, I do Hitchcock and Bond films um, because there's just so much packed into those. Everything from North by Northwest to Moonraker to, you know, the, 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 the reboots. Uh, and then I kind of close with a few David Lynch movies because I think he is very, very much exposing. I mean, I'm not saying he's necessarily, quote, a good guy, but, I'm, but his, his movies, I think, are about uh, ritual-based trauma, mind control, sex trafficking, and all this kind of stuff in Hollywood. Yeah, and we've had some uh, guests on Fiona Barnett, Jay Parker, Dave Scherter on the show. And, you know, I believe the testimony that they give uh, coming from the inside, if you will, as it relates to uh, the Satanic Pedophile Club, you know, dropping some some really big names. And uh, it's, it's I think the world we live in is, is beyond truly our comprehension to just imagine how dark uh, things can get. And I think ultimately we're going to see that manifest itself in a more visible fashion as we get well, closer. To, go ahead. You know, I absolutely agree, and that's why I think they have to try to say that there's no such thing. They have to try to normalize all this, right? So to see the normalization of all this, because it, if it's not normalized, then it shows that, hey, there's actually some real freaking evil here. Yeah, well, look, <laughs> and if there's some real hardcore spiritual evil, then there's also probably a god. Yeah, I mean, look what they're trying to do now. They're trying to even normalize pedophilia. They're trying to get pedophilia rights now. I mean, this is just unbelievable. And so, uh, you know, some of the things I, I'm looking at when, when I'm checking out movies, you know, again, we had predictive programming long before 9-11. I mm -hmm. mean, that was in uh, cartoons, even The Simpsons, uh, you know, other movies. Uh, you already mentioned the aliens and the UFOs. Uh, now, now there's kind of a trend of giants. I don't know if you've been seeing this. You know, there's talk of yeah. the Nephilim. Titans. Titans, yeah, yeah. yeah, Titans, you know, War on the Titans. The, what was that one? The Gods of Egypt. And then we had Spielberg come out with that BFG movie, which I haven't seen yet. Have you seen that one with... Uh, I haven't. I haven't yet. No. Uh -uh. Yeah, I want to check that one out. But anyway, you, you know, one of the areas that I'm I'm looking at because this is eventually going to evolve into the new age 
uh, which is a part of the third secret of Fatima. But anyway, these, this whole notion of the ascended master. So you covered Doctor Strange, and I saw it a couple weeks ago. And my goodness, you know, the main character of the movie was, you know, this ancient one. That's, mm-hmm. that's what they call Maitreya. They call him the world teacher, the ancient one, Maitreya Buddha, the Christ. And then around him, he had these masters, you know, these ascended mm-hmm. masters that are going to arrive onto the scene with the quote unquote aliens our space brothers so there's all kinds of agendas working here and so many people don't pick that up in your movies like the x-men and the avengers and even cern which i you know i didn't kind of believe that at first but even in the avengers movie uh or i think in several of them they see them mm-hmm. uh, shoot, shooting that beam into the sky and then from the other side you see all these kind of like really nasty creatures coming from you know the other side i mean there's just all kinds of agendas being mm-hmm. shoved right down in our, uh, into our throat my question for you is there an agenda that uh, you know, your average person is missing that you're that you're catching. Um, you know, obviously they're they're shoving the sodomite transgender agenda down our throat. Mm-hmm. I mean, what what's the trend now? Is is there something that you're picking up on? You're like, okay, you guys are missing this. Kinda, yeah. I, I, what I argue is that in that film, you have the presentation of this this of hermeticism and what I guess you could call Luciferianism in a very subtle way that, that masks itself as a real spirituality that masks itself as real uh, perception of reality. And what it does is basically there's a great article. It's a very difficult article because it's, it's written for a very, on a pretty technical level, but uh, for the Russian philosopher and geopolitical analyst, uh, Alexander Dugan, and it's called Russian Orthodoxy and Initiation. And the reason I mention that is not because it's, it's not like an apologetic for orthodoxy. Actually, in the last section of that article, and I'll send it to you, he goes into his thesis uh, on this spirit of Antichrist, if you will. Sure. And what he talks about is that <clears throat> in the Western Hermetic tradition, you have these guys following this sort of what he calls a brotherhood of Luxor, loosely, and he's talking about this Egyptian idea that that ultimately as i got summed up in masonry and the idea here is that that at the highest levels of the ritual magic component of things instead of believing in a spiritual realm and a transcendent god what they did was they smashed god right in in the the triune god smashed him into the spiritual realm and then therefore they made that into a technology and what i mean by that is that the the whole idea here is that the, the realm of spirit according to the Western Hermeticists and initiates, they believe to be a, a, a kind of technology that you can tap into and then therefore do all kinds of magic, right? So you could perhaps open another dimension, a portal or whatever it is that the idea is spiritually speaking. And, then, and so God in that scheme becomes a kind of a, a device that you can tr- control. And what you see in all these movies, especially all these Avengers ones, is this hyperdimensional cube, right? A hypercube or a tesseract that everybody's racing to control, right? The Avengers are trying to control it. The Red Skull is trying to control it. And when they can control this cube, they have, you know, a mark, they have the market on energy. They have superpowers and all, all this kind of stuff, right? Which I think is all kind of symbolic for what we're talking about, which is this this race or this attempt to master not just the physical realm but to master the physical realm by mastering the spiritual realm and i think that higher level physics is aimed at doing that and that's why you see the people at cern like when they put on these pageants and these performances and they're, they're literally wearing masonic garb and doing dances wearing masonic. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> masonic. yeah it's crazy <clears throat> and, and I, I think that that uh, dugan really nailed it when he was right he was looking at a writer called uh, renee Ganon, who i don't agree with necessarily but uh but uh, he has uh, talked about this very point that the, the point of the, the goal of the Luciferians is to tap into the spiritual realm and try to control it. Yeah, there's no question about that, too. I would just add, uh, as it relates to the X Men Avengers, you know, when Maitreya shows up onto the scene, he's got this five step self realization program so we could lean back on movies like Avatar and things like mm-hmm. that. You know, highly evolved superhumans no longer needing grace. We just need to progress if you will we can become gods without jesus and, and without exactly. grace i mean it gets very bizarre and unfortunately we, we know at least from a catholic perspective that most people are going to fall for it at least uh temporarily so uh that's why you know jay's work is very important to keep exposing uh you know these individuals so we, we talked a little bit just in general about the book why don't we break down this this goonies one i tell you what i've seen this movie like 
probably a half a dozen times, and I really didn't make any of the connections that you made in this, and I'm really glad to see You know this. what? Thank you, man. I, I'm the same as you. I've seen it many, many times. I grew up watching this movie, and I had contemplated in the past an analysis of it, but I thought, yeah, is, there's not really much there. And, and so I, I revisited it recently, and I, I thought, I'm going to really pay attention and see if I notice anything different. And I, I think I did. I'm not saying that I'm necessarily 100% right, but what I noticed was that there's this, this tendency in Spielberg films to operate on this process of what's called a Rube Goldberg machine. And that was the, uh, if you've probably seen this in like cartoons or if you've ever played the game Mousetrap where you kind of set a chain reaction in motion and it's like a whole bunch of little gadgets operating, you know, kind of like dominoes falling, right? And that's called a Rube Goldberg machine. It's, it's a real thing. People have competitions creating them and so forth. And I started thinking, this is actually in a lot of 80s movies. And it's in a lot of Spielberg movies. It's uh, There's one in the beginning of uh, Back to the Future, for example. So what is Spielberg trying to say by this? Well, I, I noticed in the first few scenes, <clears throat> you're actually seeing the escape of the Fratellis from jail set off a series of events, right? And it's, so it's a chain reaction that starts from this first action. And <clears throat> as I was re-watching uh, the uh, Back to the Future series, because I was, I was going to try to look at that one next, I noticed that Doc tells Marty the same thing. He says, Marty, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a chain reaction. He says, you're going to set off a series of events that will affect your family, right? So that that's for whatever reason is a big part of Spielberg's ideology or, and, you know, the other, obviously the other people he works with, Kathleen Kennedy and Frank Marshall and the different people that have worked on every Spielberg movie. <clears throat> uh, now, what does that mean? Well, we are caught in a kind of a loop, actually, which is what I talk about in um, the the uh, Doctor Strange analysis. I talk about what Douglas Hofstadter calls the strange loop, which is what you see exemplified in a lot of the artwork in that movie, Doctor Strange, where you kind of have the, if you've seen M.C. Escher's art, where it's like, uh, you know, the, the monks walking on the... Uh, um, Way the movie Labyrinth with David Bowie, right? You see, it's right, all yeah, yeah. Escher's work. Now that's called a strange loop, believe it or not, in in Escher's, or excuse me, Hofstadter's book, uh, Gerdell Escher Bach, which is a, a famous Pulitzer Prize winning book. And what he talks about in that book is how that we in our in our dimension that we live in, it's kind of we're kind of stuck in in a sort of a flat historical loop. Uh, now, from the pagan perspective, the ancient religions have always been trying to escape this loop. That's why you have, for example, the Hindu Wheel of Time, where you got to kind of meditate your way out of the, you know, the recurring uh, reincarnations, right, and, and sure. find nirvana. So th this same idea, you'll see this consistently in all, almost all pagan films or, quote, illuminous films, whatever you want to call them, perennial films, and it's always about how do we escape the prison of time, how do we escape this cube and that's why they want the power of the cube, right? So how does this relate to Goonies? Well, <clears throat> I, I talk about that in the sense that I think Spielberg is getting at that with, with Back to the Future. Like, we got to escape time through some means and so forth. But what he's talking about in Goonies is, I think, this family the, the, in the background, the Astors, because this whole this all takes place in Astoria, in Oregon, and it's, it's taking place there for a reason. And I remember a long time ago reading Chris Springmeyer's book and him talking about the Astros being involved in the drug trade. And I was always kind of skeptical. I was like, eh, maybe. So then I thought, you know, I actually want to look that up. And I, it's 100% it's all true. <laughs> even, even in mainstream media, the Astros were a total esoteric bloodline. They totally were into weird stuff. They ran the drug trade. They were high-level Freemasons. It's all true. Uh, even to, according to public uh, history records, according you know the, what lodges they were involved in and so forth. So... That wasn't an accident that uh, you know Spielberg and company chose Astoria. It has this background. Uh, the Goonies are, are are supposed to be sort of pirates, and why why are they pirates? Well, who are pirates? Pirates are uh, individuals who stole things outside of international quote law, right? That's what the Jolly Roger Skull and Bones symbol uh, represents. Right. All right. Now you saw this also in the Disney movie uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, right? right. And Jordan Maxwell's talking about this. And that's actually true. He's actually right about the, the, the Jolly Roger. Jordan Maxwell talks about the Jolly Roger. That's my Jordan Maxwell impersonation. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, I, I can't believe I never picked up on that. That's the uh, Skull and Bones, right? And that's why it's Skull and Bones. So the Goonies actually represent the, the family that's, uh, or the, they represent this uh, sort of outcast group, right? We're, we're Goonies. We're, we're the rejects. 
So they're actually linking into the mystery. They're figuring out that, oh, our whole community of Astoria is actually built on an old pirate Masonic mystery. Yeah, that's, that's what they figure out, right? And it's what sets all that off is a Rube Goldberg machine in real life. Yeah, absolutely amazing. I just can't believe I, I missed that one, especially with the whole Astoria uh, Astor connection. And we've had Fritz on uh, this radio show too, and uh, kind of unmasking some of the things we're talking about here. But yeah, just just amazing. And you also point out, uh, you know, Hunger Games too, which is another. What, what's what's some of the things you took away from Hunger Games more briefly? Uh, you know, yeah. The, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I've got another interview I got to do here in a minute with oh, okay, uh, sure. Let's go Hollywood Porter, actually. But, um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, Hunger Games is really just about Agenda 21. Actually, I think it's about the whole UN type model for re reorganizing entire cities into a, a sustainable biosphere, as they call it, right? And that's why you have the collapse of America into Pan Am, <clears throat> which is this uh, continental union type setup. And uh, everybody's kind of living in these districts that are that are kind of eco districts that are heavily socialistic, right? You can't hunt, you can't do anything on land, you're not allowed to. And what, the, but beyond what a lot of the young adult fiction shows, I do think there's a lot of interesting insights in Hunger Games where you where you're, you're seeing, for example, fake news. Uh, the the capital city, which is the tyranny. They'll actually run fake news stories about Katniss. <laughs> you know, they're going to weird stuff like that. And then what's also interesting is that Katniss figures out that the revolution that she joins is a dialectic. Yeah. Like the revolution, all they want is to be in power like President Snow did. Yeah, it's a great point. And that's another one I keep my my eye on. I try to go back and kind of revisit, see things I, uh, I'm not missing. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I know you got to get going here. And actually, i got to get ready for my, okay. my interview for uh, – for leak project but why don't you do uh, for the last minute here yeah you know, give us some shameless self-promotion upcoming articles videos projects upcoming media appearances get out uh what's going on in jade sure. Dyer's world yeah if you go to my site uh, you'll find the link there at the top uh, where you can actually purchase signed copies of esoteric hollywood and uh, it's been out for a couple weeks now it's doing really good got all five star reviews eight or ten reviews on uh, amazon eight or ten reviews on goodreads all five stars so i think everybody will, will like it and it's also good for you know, handing to your family members who might not be as interested in politics or conspiracy to wake them up through movies. And that's kind of why I wrote the book. So uh, you can get it there. And I also offer uh, podcast talks and lectures, the first hour free and the second hour for subscription. So if you go to Jay's analysis, you can subscribe uh, to that. I've got lectures on tragedy and hope, lectures on uh, Plato's Republic, lectures on Plato's uh, dialogues and so forth. So a lot of interviews, too, with good people, some of the same people that you've interviewed, um, and you can all access that at my site. And uh, if you want to follow me updates-wise, you can just follow me on uh, Twitter or Facebook uh, or Instagram or whatever. Uh, you can put your email on the blog there and follow my work. But I, I, I do I put out a lot of content, so you, you get something almost every every day, every other day at Jay's Analysis. So. Uh, uh, upcoming stuff, um, Jay Wiedner and I will be doing a TV show with uh, Gaia TV based on my book called Hidden Hollywood, where we basically just dissect films. So look for that in the next few months. Uh, and I'll be doing some uh, pretty pretty cool interviews, I think. Uh, the, the Hollywood Reporter is actually doing an interview on my book today. So Good. Good stuff. Yeah, well, we appreciate you taking time out, Jay. I know you're busy. Uh, Thank you, Eric. Appreciate and, uh, it. Yeah, we just, we get, you know, they put this agenda right in front of us, folks. It's hidden right. in plain sight, and you just kind of got to know what they're thinking, what they're looking at. Once you understand how they're thinking and processing things, then we can kind of begin to see their world. And as I mentioned, it's quite a dark world, and, and I can't say this enough. We're moving out of a Christian society uh, into this new age uh, world, if you will, and, and everything needs to be broken down. You know, out of uh, chaos comes order, they say. And right. so this is all stuff that we got to pay attention to, folks. This is all important. This is the world we live in. If you've got kids out there, I mean, talk about the, you know, the world that we're trying to create. And from our perspective, at least Jay and I's perspective, we're trying to make this a Christian world. So uh, appreciate everyone tuning in today. Again, subscribe to Tradcat Night. Hit that uh, bell for the notifications. And until next time, my good friends, stay safe and God bless.